Hey there, it's Debbie. Today's episode is a special re-release of a favorite conversation from the archives. Unless you're a longtime listener of the show, there's a good chance you haven't heard this one before. And even if you have, you just might get something completely different from it this time around. The only thing that we really have is this moment right now. But we tend to live in the past, and that's where guilt resides. Guilt resides from the past, decisions we've made, things we've said, right? And this is exactly where mindfulness does its best work. Mindfulness takes us out of that rumination space and that guilt space and puts us right back to here right now. And when we ask ourselves, what's most important right now, right? We connect with our heart, we take that breath. And we do the next best thing in this moment that we can do. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber. And today I'm talking with corporate mindfulness teacher, author, and speaker, Michelle Gale. Michelle is the author of the book, Mindful Parenting in a Messy World, and is the host of the Mindful Parenting in a Messy World podcast. Well, the previous episode I did on mindfulness, which was actually one of the very first Tilt Parenting podcast episodes, was all about the benefits of mindfulness for our kids. In this episode, Michelle and I shift the focus to the parents and explore how bringing mindfulness into our lives in simple ways can have not only a big impact in parenting with more purpose, but in getting through really difficult situations with our kids, especially when our own emotional reactions are triggered. And to be clear, we're not going to be talking about meditating for 20 minutes a day or really adding anything onto your plate. This conversation and Michelle's approach is all about being more mindful in our own interactions, noticing our emotions and responses, paying attention to what's going on in our minds and doing that internal work, which is so much about what I write about in Differently Wired. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation and get a lot out of it. So here's my conversation with Michelle Gale. Hey, Michelle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Debbie. I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation because we have a lot to talk about today, specifically around the concept of mindfulness. But I would love if you could take a few minutes just to introduce yourself to the Tilt audience, a little bit about who you are as a parent and also your work in the world. I'm happy to. I have two boys. One just turned 15, heading to high school, and the other is 11 and a half. Um, They both have, they're both wired differently. I'll say it that way. They're both wired differently. Um, My oldest has ADHD and slow processing, and my youngest has serious attention issues and visual, spatial, and language processing and auditory processing. So he's got a lot going on. So we've been, I was really appreciated your book. And reading your book and not feeling so alone um, in this journey that I've been on. So appreciating you and your community that you've built. Um, My work in the world is, I wrote a book called Mindful Parenting in a Messy World. So I'm an author. I came out last year. And I go into companies like Google and and Disney and other tech companies. And I talk to parents and do workshops and keynotes around mindful parenting. And I also teach mindfulness just in general, in corporate. And I also have a, you know, an online community and a podcast called Mindful Parenting in a Messy World that I'm, that I'm nurturing online. So that's kind of the, the grand, the grand story of all I'm doing in the world. (laughs) It's a lot. It is a lot. There's a lot of pieces to it. And, you know, I just have to say that even just the term messy, like I just think the word messy is so beautiful and so apt for especially our community because our lives can look super messy. And yeah, I think there's so much goodness in that. And that's what I appreciated about your book. And and we can talk about that more in a little bit. But I want to talk about mindfulness. I was going back, I think this is going to be episode 119 or 120, but I was going back and looking at all the episodes I've done, and I've really only done one episode on mindfulness so far, and I think it was episode two. It was with a woman here in Amsterdam named Kate Berger, who ran something called the Expat Kids Club and was Asher's therapist when we first moved abroad. But her personal love is mindfulness and is very involved in mindfulness, especially with kids. So we focused on mindfulness 
with kids, how we can support them in developing a mindfulness practice and what that would look like. But we didn't really talk much about the parenting side. So that's what I want to get into today because as I was reading your book and, you know, and through our conversations, there is so much overlap in what I'm trying to share with parents in terms of how to be more present in our messy world. And that you wrote the book on the mindfulness piece and it's so in alignment. So let's talk about big picture mindfulness. What is mindfulness? You know, what is your definition of that when we hear it? It's kind of a almost a buzzword now. It, it, it's so out there in the media. But what is mindfulness? Um, a simple definition is paying attention on purpose. Right? So I always highlight on purpose and with 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 non judgmental kindness and compassion. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're paying attention on purpose and we're not judging whatever's coming up, whatever that is, right? Whether it's joy and happiness or fear and sadness, it's a way to get curious and interested in whatever it is that's coming up in our lives. And for parents, you know, I came to my regular practice. I explored mindfulness in college for a few years and, but came to really came to my regular path and practicing regularly when I had two very young children. My oldest son was like, three and a half, four, and my youngest had just been six months old. And that's when I started practicing. And so I had to be really creative (laughs) with how I wove it into my life because it didn't look like, you know, you often hear sit at the same time every day in the same place, right? And that just goes out the window when you've got two little children or children of any age, you know, it can be very difficult. And, and it was my, my practice was very inconsistent, but I did a lot of, you know, small practices many times throughout the day. And I often call it, I I built this muscle of center. I learned to center myself. I learned to come home to myself over and over and over again throughout the day by weaving it into what I was already doing. So when I teach mindfulness to parents, it's always look at your day look at what you already do. So when you're, um, you know, changing your child, can you feel the, the, you know, the fabric of their clothing, right? When you're getting them out of the bath, can you smell, you know, their sweet, fresh hair, right? Really just kind of really living into the sensory experience of our lives. So hopefully that's helpful. So what I like about that so much is it's really about presence, right? And which, you know, as you're talking and like that can be, it can feel like a double-edged sword intellectually, Right. Sometimes if our kids are engaging in really challenging behavior, really leaning into it and being super present is not what we want to be doing, right? We want it to be over. We're trying to avoid that behavior. So talk about what mindfulness can do then for parents who are raising kids who are more challenging, who, you know, what, what is the connection between that mindfulness piece and then how we can better show up for kids, especially kids who are experiencing challenges or their behavior is really tough. Mindfulness helps us build that muscle of what we can tolerate, right? What we can hold without collapsing or snapping, right? So when we practice over and over again, it expands our ability to be able to hold discomfort, right? And that's a big part of leadership as a parent or when I work with executives that I'm teaching the same thing, right? As an executive in an organization, you have to be able to tolerate more and more discomfort the higher up you get. That's part of your job. And as parents, that's also part of our job, particularly when we have kids that have behavioral issues. We want to be able to tolerate more and more of their discomfort and not take it personally and also be able to be with them. And instead of being in that triggered, angry state, because when, when we get triggered and we're angry, it's biological. Cortisol is rushing through our system. Our amygdala in our brain is, is going crazy. And we lose, you know, our prefrontal cortex in the front of our forehead, which is our decision making and best practices and being able to choose what we do next. We lose the ability to do that. We lose creative thinking. So if we can be able to calm ourselves enough to be able to be present with our children, we can actually start to uncover detective like what's really going on here. What is this about? Right? Because if 
if anybody studied nonviolent communication, right, it's never about the behavior. It's always about the unmet need. So there's always, there's always pain and suffering under that behavior, right? It's never, it's always that. It's never something different. And that doesn't mean we should be allowing them to hurt themselves or hurt us or be in danger, you know, that we have to hold and contain, of course, and create boundaries. But within those boundaries, can we stay with it? You know, my little guy, you know, before we understood a lot of what was going on for him, was just, he had temper tantrums for years. He was very little. And it seemed he was always on, well, he wasn't always, but so often on the floor just screaming. And we couldn't understand what it was about. But I had enough practice to be able to sit with him and say, I'm here. Like if you need a hug, whatever you need, like I'm, I'm willing to sit here with you. Right? I'm willing to hold this with you. And I would stay there until he was done, you know, and he may have hugged me. He may have not hugged me throughout it. He may have just sat there screaming, but he knew I was willing to be in this with him. And, and it was a good practice for me to be able to, to do that. Wow. Uh- so powerful. Yeah. You know, even just the phrase to tolerate discomfort, I've never heard it said like that before. And that makes so much sense. You know, I talk about learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable, but this, but in that moment, being able to hold the space, it is such a gift for our kids. And if we're able to do it, and I, it's also can be so, so challenging. Um, you know, you talked about triggers, um, which we all have. Um, and so I want to ask then, you know, exploring your triggers and you talk about this in your book, um, exploring what your personal triggers are as your, as a way to become more aware. What does that exactly mean to you? And how do you suggest parents listening to this would approach doing that work? Yeah, there's a few ways to do it, but when I'm working with parents one-on-one or in a group, I'll often have them write down and I would encourage your listeners to write down What are the behaviors in other people that drive you crazy, right? So what are the behaviors in other people that drive you crazy? And then also thinking through your day, where do you get upset and tight, you know, and anxious? And, you know, for me, I can give my example. This might help people in thinking it through for themselves. Like it was being late, right? If I perceived we were about to be late somewhere, I would start to get really irritated and it would come on very quickly and really just everything would go sideways, you know, and, and it was me, (laughs) it was me. Like if we're going to be late, we're going to be late. And it was probably on me, right. That I didn't start early enough because I'm I'm the fan and, and, um, and I would get mad at everybody else. And another big one for me was, um, if my kids were seemingly ungrateful, Right. If I was perceiving them as ungrateful, which like what kids don't act ungrateful at some point, but that was <laughs> a huge trigger for me. And so parenting is the greatest opportunity for our own personal and spiritual growth. You know, who are we? Who am I as a person? How do I study myself? Again, I'll bring that. You know, I often say it's like a detective. We're studying ourselves. We're studying our children. And this isn't easy. You know, I often say mindful parenting, conscious parenting. It's not for the faint of heart. You know, this is not just a think it through, read a book. Okay, you know, done. This is a life's practice. And this time that we have with our children, this short time, really, that we have with them, they are actually our greatest teachers. They will push our buttons over and over again in the same way until we learn what we need to learn about ourselves. And we get lots of opportunities, as I always say, but I love that. And I like that idea of just writing what those things are, those triggers are down, because then you can at least not be caught off guard as much, and then start noticing a lot more, you know, when you're in that like, oh, yeah, it's that feeling again. I know this. There I go. And that's when we bring in the centering practice, right? So when we practice centering, right, maybe it's just, you know, I'll teach a quick three breaths practice. I always teach this to parents three breaths. So on the first breath, it's just breathing in and breathing out and just watching the breath come in and watching the breath go out closely. And then the second breath, relaxing the body, whatever that means for you. I'll often say, just feel gravity, you know, relax your jaw. And the third breath, 
you ask yourself a question, what's most important now, right? So just noticing the breath, allowing the body to relax and asking yourself a question, what's most important now? So that's just one idea of the centering practice. It could just be one breath in and out, you know, sitting up straight, you know, that posture matters. So I often tell parents, like if, if things are tough, you will automatically constrict, right? When things are stressful in the house. So open up your posture. Um, you know, they did a study at Harvard years ago where they had people take a really tight posture, like squeeze themselves into a ball and spit into a cup and they measured cortisol levels, right? Which tells us how stressed we are essentially. And then they had the people take a big open posture. And this is within like 30 seconds each time they did the posture and had them spit in the cup again and their cortisol levels had come way down. Hmm. So our posture matters, posture and breath. Just take on whatever kind of centering practice works for you. And then when you, when you notice those triggers, right, they come up, you say, ah, okay, there I go. Let me take a breath. Let me do my three breaths practice. And now I'm back. You know, and sometimes we catch it and sometimes we don't, but if we practice enough over time, all of a sudden we notice we can tolerate discomfort more. We'll be right back after this quick break. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I for one want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to do's. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing that centering practice I love the question, like the breathing I do. Um, I'm not sure I relax the body so much, um, but I like that too. But that question of what's most important now is huge. You know, if, if you can get to that point, especially, you know, I'm going back to what you're talking about when your kid is having a really tough time and you're 
just being with them, if you can get to that question in that space, that will change everything. It will change your reaction. It will fuel your ability to tolerate that discomfort. Your child, I feel strongly that they know that they know that you've got their back and that you're there for the highest good for everybody in that room. Yeah. And don't skip over the body. So the breath and the question is good, but the body, so much of our emotion comes from the body. We hold so much tension in the body. The body gives us so much information, right? It's from the body where really decisions are often made. It sounds kind of crazy, but decisions are made from, from the stance of our body, right? If we're constricted and tight Um, we make very different decisions in our life, right? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I react this way? Do I react that way? When our bodies are open and more soft, we have more choice in what's going to come next. We really do. So don't skip the body. (laughs) I will not. I will not. Listeners, you heard it from Michelle. Do not skip the body. I'm stretching right now as we're talking just to open up a little bit. I love that. So I I still, I want to go a little deeper into this, the hard moments, because I know that's where so many listeners are. I just recently got back from the book tour and talked to so many parents and a lot of the parents who are regular listeners of this podcast, I know are kind of in what I affectionately refer to as the dark years, but you know, where you can sometimes just feel like you're under attack, or you're, you know, you're just the recipient of a lot of intense emotion and behavior. So can you just say a little bit more about you say that being mindful isn't about being calm all the time and staying calm in those moments? Like, is this just something that practicing the mindfulness in these other moments and building that muscle, it will just get easier over time? do you screw up? What do we do when we screw up when we're not able to stay in that space? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we do screw up. And I, I, the story I often tell is my, you know, my kids know all about the work that I do. And, um, you know, they don't even realize how much these practices are woven through their language and their lives. You know, I observe it. Um, and other people observe it, but it's, it's quiet to them. Um, but they know about me and they know what I do. And so especially my youngest, if I'm upset with him, you know, and I do kind of raise my voice or get a little angry, he'll say, you shouldn't be allowed to teach mindfulness. (laughs) 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 Look how angry you are. And (laughs) I love it when he does it, you know, because I always stop and kind of laugh and, you know, it breaks the ice, you know, between us, that kind of coldness that's going on. And And I will always say the same thing, like, you know what, just because we practice mindfulness and because I do meditation and do the work that I do does not mean that I don't get big emotions sometimes. I do, just like you do, right? You can calm yourself and and center yourself. And you, how many times he's been almost angry and he's taken a breath or he's felt gravity or feet on the floor or any of these little things that I've taught him over the years. And he'll say... I was going to get upset, but I didn't, you know, I came back, you know, I took a breath. So, you know, or I, some, he hurt himself, right? He's very afraid of blood. So we've been working with that a lot. Every time he gets a, a cut, he's panicked. And so we've been practicing with that. Like, can you tolerate that if you breathe and pause and come back to yourself? So yes, like we are going to mess up. I mean, that's the, that's the way of it. That's why the book is called Mindful Parenting in a Messy World. It's messy. And when we do what I, what I do with my kids and I teach is to make the implicit explicit. So when we notice and we'll notice it because the more we practice and the more we're able to keep ourselves in a more kind of calm, open, peaceful state, the more surprising and intense those moments of anger become, right? We'll notice them and they don't feel good. They feel even less good (laughs) than Mm -hmm. they did before. And so we notice it and I will talk out loud to my kids like, God, I was really triggered and like my heart felt tight and my stomach felt tight and I was really angry and it didn't feel good in my body or my heart. And like, I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry I yelled and I'm really curious what the experience was for you while, while I was being that way, you know, and sometimes they're willing to tell and sometimes they're not, 
And sometimes they'll just say, it's okay, mama, you know, no worry. But now I've, I've spoken it out loud and that naturally gives them the language to do that for themselves. Right. So we are the models. And when we snap and when we say something we regret, regret Dan Siegel, if you're I'm, I'm guessing you're familiar with Dan Siegel's work, whoever's not, he has amazing work in the world. And he talks about repair right? he talks about repair. So repair is actually one of the most important pieces of parenting that we come back and repair. It actually creates the, the relationship and the connection in a, in a deeper way than it was before. So when things go wrong and things go, you know, I was telling my son yesterday, we were taking a walk into town and he said, tell me about, you know, some of da- your and dad's like, did you ever have a really hard time? Like, were you ever really mad at each other where you just didn't even like each other? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, yeah, that has happened over the years. And we're, we're going to have our 16 year anniversary tomorrow. And we've been together, you know, for 20 so sure, we've, we've gone through some dark times together. And you know what? Every time we go through those dark times, we come out the other side stronger as long as we're willing to lean in with each other and as long as we're willing to go through it and, and stay anyway, right? We stay. And that's kind of this metaphor that we're talking about in mindfulness. Like things are rough and things are bad and we don't feel good. But what do we often do? We eat, we drink, we shop. You know, we shut down and we don't feel the feels and that doesn't bring us any closer to our, you know, kind of pure essence within us. So that's a long way to answer your question. No, it was a great answer. And now I have three more questions for you. And I'm trying to think of the logical order in which to ask the questions. Um, what I love about what you just said is, you know, talking about repairing just that you know, personally, when I have a, a less than brilliant parenting moment with Asher, I always reconnect afterwards and acknowledge what I could have done differently. But I've never asked that question. I'm curious what the experience was like for you. And that feels so important and meaty. And yes, of course, they're not going to necessarily, well, let me tell you exactly, you know, that, that you're not going to always get that insightful answer. But I can just imagine the potential for dialogue that it opens up and it's so respectful, like it's taking it to an even higher level. So I really love that. Yeah. And, you know, we can get specific, you know, with my kids, I'll often say, you know, if they're willing, like, are you willing? I'd love to hear, you know, how that was for you. And if they're willing in that moment, and if they're not, that's fine too. Like, okay, we're done. Right. Moving on. But if they're willing, like, did you notice anything like in your, like where in your body, like when I was being so crazy, like what was going on in your body, right? Because that's a sign for them how they respond to stress. And this is so we're priming them very early to understand what 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 stress is like in their body. You know, did you notice any thoughts? Like were there any thoughts coming up? Like any emotions that were there? You can ask them, you know, you can kind of guide them through it a little bit if they're open and willing. And some kids are more open and some kids you have to like ease into it little by little and you often don't want to start, I should say, w- during those intense situations, right? That shouldn't necessarily be the first time you ask them that. But you start asking them questions when they're a little grumpy. Or like, when you notice you're grumpy, like, what, do you, what thoughts do you notice come up? Or what emotions? Or is there anywhere like in your body where you feel grumpy? You know, and then also you're making it explicit in yourself when you are sad or when you're happy, like where you notice it. So, then when the time comes and there's that intense situation, there's a little more priming for it. Like that can be very supportive or you could just try it. You know, some kids, children are, will surprise you. You know, I taught mindfulness for three years in my son's school as a volunteer when I first started teaching maybe six or seven years ago. And they just blew me away. I taught from preschool up until the middle school and at every stage their ability to connect with themselves internally after even just five minutes of a short practice was unbelievable. There was a little girl in second or third grade and um, we were doing a lesson on thoughts and out of the blue within the lesson, she suddenly, (gasps) and I said, what? And she said, I'm not making my thoughts. And I was, I mean, I'm tears in my eyes right now, even just saying it out loud. 
to be that age and to have this sense that thoughts are actually not very personal to us. If you pause and if you're in a meditation and you're doing, you know, really come back to your breath and notice when you have thoughts, you will see very quickly, we are not making them. They are nonsensical. You know, there's a sign on my refrigerator that says, don't believe everything you think, right? Because (laughs) there's a lot of mayhem and nonsense that goes on in there. And the earlier we can understand that, right? This little girl, second or third grade, she's like, I'm not making my thoughts. It's just unbelievable. And it's so simple. It really doesn't take very much. We get more and more, it becomes more and more difficult. I think the older we get and the more mucked up our ego and our psychology and everything Mm -hmm. gets, but when they're little, they're so open. You know, my story is they're just, they're still so connected to source, you know, whatever that means for you, you know, from the universe, right? They're still so connected when they're young that these practices just just come so naturally. Yeah. And and they're also things that people in our generation, this is not the way we were parented. And most of us, like certainly my parents did not ask me, you know, what the experience is like for you. What are you thinking right now? Like that was not what was happening in my house. No, and, I, uh, so I think it makes total sense that our kids, you know, why shouldn't our kids be able to go really deep and really tap into that? It's just, we, we don't always see them in that light because of our own experience. So this is a reframe for so many people too, just to kind of reconsider the relationship they want to have with their child and also seeing them in a more whole way, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a whole paradigm shift in parenting for sure. You know, most of us were not parented this way and this is not, it's definitely not easy. Um, But for me and the reason I do the work in the world, the work that I do in the world is because I believe with my whole heart that if we raise a generation of children awake and aware and mindful, we have the potential of healing our planet and our society and our communities and our families. Like for me, that's where the, that's where the core of the healing is going to come from. It's from having people who are aware and who are conscious and who are open and who are willing to look inside. So that's why I do what I do. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Lynn, this time of year, parenting can be such a fluster clux. You've come to the right place. I'm Lynn Lyons, and I've been treating anxious families for over 30 years. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law and co-host Robin Hudson. Join us for Fluster Clux, a podcast for parents who worry. Wait, that's everybody. Yeah, these last few years have felt like one long anxiety attack for so many. Why do you think parents are always surprised that a podcast about anxiety relates to them, even if no one in their house has an anxiety disorder? Well, worry is human. Everyone does it. And anxiety shows up when we face uncertainty. All the parenting tips you've taught me have been essential. I love to break it down into skills we need to manage worry in our families. We've covered so many topics 
depression, burnout, meltdowns, perfectionism. Don't forget scary mothers-in-law. Right. But of course, that's not my mother-in-law. Because that's my mother. And a listener. As a psychotherapist, I like to teach parents and kids how to respond to everyday moments in healthy ways. Managing anxiety really can be taught. It really can. And I'll even tell you what to say. We talk about serious stuff, but without being too serious. Anxiety wants everything serious. Anxiety doesn't stand a chance when we're laughing, even about the tough stuff. So... Now I'm going to flip it around and um, and I'm going to ask you, okay, so what's in it for us then as parents? So what I'm hearing, <laughs> it just, I'm always wanting to bring it back to parents who are in a hard, in a tough spot. So it's so clear to me that this, you know, the benefits for our kids and for them to grow up with this, with these tools and with this level of self-awareness. And I do believe it has so much potential to shift things for our for the world, for our society. What does mindfulness do for parents who are in the moment, parents who are who are in a hard place with with their parenting journey? What what are the gifts that it brings them? Well, for one, you know, I just bow to all of the parents out there going through this. And and there I do not in any way want anyone to feel guilty that they can't pull this off, right? Right now. <laughs> because life is so hard. Right. And life, life can be really hard and it can be very difficult to implement this kind of practice when you're in the midst of that. So I just want to say that out loud. And if there's an intention there that there's an interest in this, there is like the research is very clear that's out there on mindfulness. I mean, there's a lot of meta data out there. You know, it, it lowers our anxiety. It increases our health possibilities. It makes us happier right? I mean, the happiness quote goes up. So if what we want is to live a life of more ease and more joy and more peace, these practices work. I mean, I'm living proof. I had, uh, I have high anxiety. I still do. And I still have people will say, are you, are you, do you still have anxiety? And I say, absolutely. I just, it doesn't run the show. Like I don't take it seriously anymore. The anxiety is very much still there very often, but I don't, I have a very different relationship to it, right? So if parents can imagine who are listening right now that how they relate to their current situation, whatever that might be, and the stressors in it, and there's that, you know, that tightening and that stress and that unhappiness and there's wishing it could be another way, there's another way to be with what's happening right now. There's a, poss- there's a possibility of relating to it in a very different way. And that's what these practices offer, that we can meet our lives, even the most difficult part of our lives, with more openness, with more love, with more compassion for ourselves and for our, for our children. So it very much, it, and it can happen quite quickly, you know, with, with a very little bit of practice. You know, there can be a, enough of a shift that you find that ease. You know, if anyone's listening, and I don't know if it's for free or not, it's terrible, I probably should, but there's a a website called Simple Habit. And I did a seven day, five minute a day mindfulness program for them, specifically for parents. So it's called Simple Habit. And I'm sorry if it's a paid thing. I really, I'm really not totally sure. Um, I, I need to put something for free on my website, something like that, <laughs> get something together. But that does exist um, if anyone's interested, because that's just very short, you know, for seven days. And it might be able to just get enough of a, oh, on my website, I have three meditations right now that are for free at michellegale.com. I think there's one on thoughts, on emotions. Um, I can't remember exactly what they are. But just getting a little bit of that practice and then just noticing, you know, even if it's just five minutes a day and then just noticing in that moment, how am I meeting this moment differently than I was before? And something may shift and something may not, but over time, if you do it enough, you will notice that really, I say it over and over again, we don't take our lives quite so personally. Hmm. It feels like things are happening to us, right? My life is happening to us but it's actually happening for us, through us, with us, right? It's not being, being put on us. We actually have a lot more control of our lives and how we meet it than we feel like we do right now. 
Yes. And this is again why I, when we first connected, it was such a kismet because I mean, that's what I'm trying to share in Differently Wired too, is that you can experience this differently, you know, the current situation. So I just love the way this connects so deeply with the work that I'm doing and what I'm trying to support parents and doing. And you're sharing so many great tools. And I want to be conscious of the time, but I just have one more question. You mentioned the word guilt. And I just want to look at that for just a minute. That is such a big concept for so many, for so many parents, generally speaking, but especially for parents who are raising kids who are atypical. Do you have thoughts about specifically parents who are feeling guilt, whether it's guilt over what their child's going through or not, maybe recognizing their differences soon enough or guilt over an inability to handle it the way you think you should or be more evolved than you, uh, than you are? How do you suggest parents who are experiencing that move through it? Yeah, well, I think it rolls right into everything we've been talking about, right? These practices help us to meet the guilt in a different way. And we don't expect the guilt to go away, right? I mean, I live these practices. And, um, you know, we just had our son's neuroscience done again. And my youngest, like his attention scores were just to the floor. And we haven't ever tried medication. It's been the one thing I haven't tried. And I've lived with that conversation going on in my mind and seeing, I can give it my own example, right? Noticing that guilt arising. What if medication is the right thing? What if I've done the wrong thing? Right. And then meeting that, seeing it, right? Because I can see it arise. I see it arise. There it is. And I'm able to have a little bit of space from it. I'm able to take a breath, you know, and be with it and just say, I've made the best decisions that I could, you know, following my heart and with the information that I had. And then come back to this moment because the should the past and the future are they don't even exist, right? It's just like memories from our mind. The only thing that we really have is this moment right now. But we tend to live in the past and that's where guilt resides. Guilt resides from the past, decisions we've made, things we've said, right? And this is exactly where mindfulness does its best work. Mindfulness takes us out of that rumination space and that guilt space and puts us right back to here right now. And when we ask ourselves, what's most important right now, right? We connect with our heart, we take that breath, and we do the next best thing in this moment that we can do. And that's all we can do. But this is where those practices do their best work because we will, guilt is not going to go away, right? When we have these kinds of kiddos, we decide what therapy you know, which school do we homeschool? Do we not homeschool? Right. All of these things that we're deciding on. And it can always feel like, you know, we did the wrong thing. And can we come back to this moment and trust, you know, our heart, you know, come, that's really when we come back to our heart and you just put your hand on your heart, close your eyes, take that breath. You know, what's most important right now and just do that thing right now <laughs> and then do the next thing that next now. <laughs> You know, that's all we have. I'm a huge fan of Eckhart Tolle, um, who I think is a wonderful teacher. I'm actually just listening to his book. He has two books that I love, but one is The Power of Now. And I suggest if anybody hears me say that they listen to it, don't buy the, I mean, you can buy the book if you really love to read, but really listen to it. He's a, he's a beautiful teacher. And, and this is where, what he talks about. There is nothing else but this moment. Everything else is just you know, when you try to think of the past, if you close your eyes and try to imagine it, it's very fuzzy. It's not clear. Right? You can't really be with it. So just come back to this moment and be with that guilt in this moment and acknowledge I'm feeling guilt right now, even just labeling it. There's some wonderful research around labeling and our emotions, right? I'm feeling bad about the guilt that I'm having right now. Even just saying that quietly to ourselves in our mind or out loud actually brings us back to ourselves. It lowers our cortisol. It calms down the amygdala in our brain, just labeling it. So I would encourage your parents just to start with that. Start with, I'm feeling really bad about the guilt I'm experiencing right now. Now, and I know I'm a loving, caring parent doing the best I can. 
That's great. I'm so glad I asked that last question because that was gold. Um, no, I love all of that and so practical. Um, thank you for sharing that. And we're running a little long. So I would love if you could let us know we've talked around your book. So just maybe take a a sentence or two to tell us about your book and then also where listeners can connect with you. Yeah, thank you. So it's mindful parenting in a messy world, living with presence and parenting with purpose and buying it on Amazon is probably the easiest way to go. And people can connect with me on my website. You you could go to be a mindful parent.com or michellegale.com, but be a mindful parent.com is easier. And you can join my, my mailing list. I send out something usually once a week, but I'm getting ready to launch a online conference this fall that people might be interested in and some um, just core foundational mindful parenting programs that I'm, that I'm building right now. So I'd love to connect with your community. And if they have any questions for me, just to email me at michelle at michellegale.com. Excellent. And listeners, I will, of course, include all the links in the show notes page for this episode. So if you want to connect, that's an easy way to do it as well. Michelle, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. I didn't get through all my questions, but I think we covered so many powerful concepts. And I know this is going to be really useful. It's super useful for me already. Uh, You know, I think that I know all this stuff and there's so much more to learn. (laughs) So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and just uh, being on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for all the work you do. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Michelle's website, her podcast, her book, and all of the other resources we discussed, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 118. If you like what we're doing at the Tilt Parenting Podcast and you want to support this little show, there are a few easy and meaningful ways you can do this. One is to join my Patreon campaign. Patreon is an online platform that allows people to make a small monthly contribution to support the work of an artist or a musician or a podcaster. It's super easy to sign up and even a small donation helps. In fact, the contributions I'm getting through Patreon right now through listeners like you are helping me cover the costs associated with paying Donna, my awesome editor for this show. So if you would like to join those Patreons and help support what I'm doing here, visit patreon.com slash tilt parenting and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash tilt parenting. You can also find a link on every podcast episode show notes page. The other way you can help, and I ask for this every week, but if you haven't done so, please head over to iTunes, leave a rating or a review, or you can do both. There are just so many parenting podcasts out there. There are more that are popping on the scene every week. And so having those ratings and a lot of reviews helps keep our show highly visible. That helps me continue to reach out and get the big guests that we want to bring on the show. So thank you so much for your help with that. And thanks again, as always, for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts.